Hey guys, you know, coming up on A to Z today, the Braves are just spectators and that's okay. Also, what the transfer portal tells us about Georgia. And finally, how will the Hawks respond? That's next on A to Z. This is A to Z with Mark Zinno, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. How did we get here? If you're not the number one pick, guess what? You have no guarantee. That's where you are. And it starts. Does that make me a genius? Yes. Now. Good afternoon. Welcome to A to Z here on Locked On Sports Atlanta, where today I tell you sometimes it's okay to sit back and watch. Welcome in. We are live here on a Wednesday as we get you set for the midday, uh, the midweek hump day. Make sure you give us a follow on Twitter at Locked On ATL. I'm at Mark Zeno, M A R K Z I N N O. Don't forget to subscribe to that YouTube channel as well. We're on Roku TV. However, you get your Roku TV on the Amazon Fire Stick, download that Roku TV app, check out all the shows on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Uh, we're going to get to a lot of different things today with the Falcons on a bye, none of it including them, of course, but we will discuss several different things here, including the Atlanta Braves, as uh, we are right in the middle of the winter meetings with the owners. And it's interesting because, you know, as this thing gets underway here, you're starting to see very, very quickly a flurry, and I mean a flurry of signings to go. Um, and, and here's the deal. Like, obviously Aaron judge not signed yet down to the Yankees and giants. It looks like nobody else is really involved in on that. Still waiting for that shoe to drop. But the big news yesterday, uh, two major signings too, as the Mets lost Jacob deGrom earlier in the week, they bring back Justin Verlander, uh, as well. The Phillies add shortstop Trey Turner. So that's the first domino to fall in the shortstop category uh, as it pertains to Dansby Swanson. And he got a haul from the Philadelphia Phillies, you know, more on Dansby here in a minute, but you know what, what I think is paramount more than anything uh, as the Braves sit back here is that, look, it's okay for them to sort of be on the sideline here and be spectators and let the chips fall where they may. Clearly they have an offer in, in my guess, I shouldn't say clearly. It's my guess. They already have an offer in a Dansby. And Dansby is going out there right now and weighing other offers against that and what he's going to get, right? Like that sort of feels like where this is right now. It it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, one way or another, we we have no idea what sort of direction he's leaning, but, you know, I I would be shocked if the, if the Atlanta Braves haven't made an offer yet at this point in time, Alex Anthopoulos is too good at this and he's way, way too um, savvy and smart not to, at least let Dansby have an offer in hand before he walks out of the building. Um, with the NL East being restacked, that should be no surprise. Um, once again, the Braves are in a position where they don't really have to do much. I mean, we already know about all the contracts, Olsen, Albies, Riley, uh, Acuna, Harris. These guys are all locked up, not to mention, you know, uh, Strider is under contract. You still have Riley. Uh, Riley, uh, uh, Kyle Wright and and Max Freed under control for a short amount of time. I mean, you know, and, and before we sit here and grade all of these these you know early signings by Alex Anthopoulos as absolute successes, you do have to wait a little bit longer. You have to see about production. You have to see about availability. And, and as I've said, of all those guys I've named, the three in the infield and the two in the outfield, and even Strider to a certain extent, those six contracts, like you know, if if three out of six of them make it all the way to fruition, that's a pretty good hit rate, right? Like, in general, it is. So if four out of six of them, it's amazing. But if three out of six of those contracts make it through to the end um, without having to be altered, changed, or whatever, well, then, yeah, that's a pretty good success rate. All that aside, you know, I bring all this up to say that they have a lot of pieces in place. They are waiting on what's going on with Dansby. and. That's a fair thing to do. Now, you know, I'm sure Alex, much like he did with Freddie Freeman, um, has another deal in place if Dansby doesn't go his way. I'd be surprised to see him didn't. Again, I don't think that Vaughn Grissom is the answer, and I don't believe that the Braves think that Vaughn Grissom is the answer yet. They don't have enough to go on to know whether he is or he isn't. Um, and some of you say, well, of course, we look at Michael Harris. He's a, a different, different. Vaughn Grissom was never going to be in the Rookie of the Year conversation. Vaughn Grissom d- d- did not uh, 
play as difficult a position as Michael Harris does in center field. Second base is nowhere near as difficult as center field is. And um, he clearly just doesn't have the same tools that Michael Harris has. So I don't think it's fair to compare them. Um, what, what I think is the one wild card here for the Braves is now that the Dodgers have officially lost Trey Turner, they're in the market for a shortstop. And could they swoop in and offer Dansby the money that he wants? And is that a little bit of an easier landing spot in the softer transition? Why? Because Freddie Freeman picks up the phone and goes, yeah, uh, why don't you come here and play with us? We're going we're, we're gonna to go win a lot of ball games here, and we're going to the playoffs. You know, I, I think that's it. Um, and, and so from that standpoint, I think that really does change the game a little bit. Um, I, I don't know. I, I am genuinely uh, conflicted about where the Braves go if Dansby goes somewhere else. Uh, you can't deny what a major piece he is to that team. Um, and you can't deny what a major piece he would be to any team. You know, I, I think generally, um, I think generally that when it comes down to Dansby, the idea that all he's going to do is hit 280, hit 25 home runs, drive in 85, 90 RBIs, and play an above average shortstop, well, that's not sexy and it's not going to get you to an all star game all that often. You know what it's going to do? It's going to help you win championships. And that, that should be enough. It really, really should be enough. Um, and sitting here as we are recording this, um, I get the news that Aaron Judge is returning to the Yankees, nine years, $360 million. Deal not official, but will be done. And that was from John Morosi. So there is that. Um, at least that news is, you know, one more guy off the table. There is that. By the way, uh, before we move on here, I have to add one more piece of news in. Um, and that was simply that uh, I was exactly today years old when I learned that the MLB had switched to a draft lottery. When did I miss this? Like, whoa, whoa. First of all, draft lotteries are stupid. Okay? They're absolutely stupid. Uh, I, am, I am not sure how and when I missed this in the latest collective bargaining agreement that they were going to have a draft lottery. Uh, and apparently it's only for the first five or six picks. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, wasn't aware. Learned that today. Raise your hand if you weren't aware with me. Okay, I guess I'm the only one. All right, that's fine. Regardless, um, so they had a draft lottery. It was won by the Pittsburgh Pirates. Oh, thankfully, the Braves will never be in this situation where they need to worry about this. Um, but it went Pirates, Nationals, Tigers, Rangers, Twins, and Athletics were the top six teams. And again, apparently it was uh, in the last, um, you know, collective bargaining agreement, 18 teams that didn't reach the postseason would vie for the first six selections. Odds are based on the 2022 winning percentage range from 16% for the Pirates, Nationals, and A's to 0.2% for the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, and I didn't even know this, too. Like, this stuff you learn. See, but you're not even paying attention. Um, the lottery picks uh, for MLB are more than any other sport. Well, it's only the first four picks that are lottery picks for the NBA. Um, and then two, and it's just two for the NHL. So once they draw the first four for the NBA, the rest are just stacked in order. Okay. They don't draw all 13, 14, whatever it is. Things you learn, guys. You see, it's not always like, uh, you know, I'm the smartest guy in the room. That's for darn sure. I think we've learned that for many years now here. In Atlanta. One thing I am smart on is gambling. And why am I smart? Because I go to betonline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odd lines and games. Find reviews and news of every league, NFL, college football, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information, podcasts, live in game betting scores. They've got you covered with all of it. So head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action that's happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. Um, okay. Yesterday also opened um, that transfer portal thing. Uh, and boy, you know, I'm not sure who the people are out there that are against the transfer portal, but you shouldn't be. Um, 
it's it's very interesting to note that this was the busiest week in the history of the transfer portal. Um, you know, there were people who got in the transfer portal right after midnight on December 5th. Uh, there were other people who waited, but there were other people who announced that they were going to do it. Um, and, and there are some pretty gaudy numbers here overall. Um, based on players who announced on social media, um, there was known that there were more than 200 that were going to pop in the transfer portal on December 5th. The final count for Monday um, was 453 F FBS scholarship players, 265 on Power 5 rosters, 188 at the current group of five schools, all hitting the market in one day. Um, they are coming up to 800 F total FBS transfers, and they'll probably surpass over 1,000. Now, of the 407 Power 5 players currently in the transfer portal, and this is Tuesday as of noon, according to The Athletic, 38 quarterbacks, 33 running backs, 67 wide receivers, 18 tight ends, 42 offensive linemen, 58 defensive linemen, 51 linebackers, 86 defensive backs, and 14 specialists. Uh, a whole lot of ACC quarterbacks jumped in there. DJ Uyogalale, Devin Leary, Brennan Armstrong, Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech's Jeff Sims, Keaton Slovis. So uh, Phil Jerkovich already stayed in the conference and moved on to Pitt. So, but he did leave Boston College. So there's that. Those are some of the bigger names there. A um, lot of wide receivers, obviously, as we mentioned before, uh, the, no, the number of 67 second highest behind defensive backs. So there's plenty of wide receivers moving around. And look, it works out really well. Some of these wide receivers who feel they got talent want to go to a school maybe that has a better quarterback. And if they'll take them, great. It can up their stats. But all these kids are doing this in the name of just getting – you know, a better chance to get drafted. That's fine. It's totally fine. Totally, totally, totally fine. Um, and, and case in point, you know, uh, I don't know why people would be against this. I think it's good for the sport. I think it's good for every school that has a chance to rebuild quickly. It doesn't take three or four years of a recruiting class. You don't have to suffer through three and four win seasons. And look, that's why Jeff Collins got fired. Plain and simple. Like, you have a transfer portal. Guys can move in and out of it and do it fairly routinely. Like, if you're not hitting that thing to make your team better, you shouldn't have back-to-back -back three- and four-win seasons anymore. You get guys in there who can play, and you move things around. So, um, it, it, case in point, you've seen it too many other places happen. Coach comes in, all of a sudden, boom, eight, nine wins. Okay, there you go. Now, it was interesting more than anything to me, at least, and this is very telling. Um. Do you know which Power 5 program had more players answer the transfer portal in this cycle than anybody? Yeah, you guessed it. Alabama. 19 players headed into the transfer portal, including 12 scholarship collections. Now, I don't know what that says to you. What it says to me a little bit is that there it might be a changing of the guard here, and there might be a little bit of a, uh, a state of influx or, or transition, rather, for Alabama. Uh, you know, they are now chasing Georgia. And the fact that 19 players are leaving Bama, eh, you could say it signals a variety of different things. Um, but at least I'll tell you it to me, if players are getting out of there, it's either because they don't, have a, they don't feel like they have a chance to play or they don't feel like they have a chance to win or they don't like what's going on. Plain and simple. You know, that to me is is what it really says. Uh, and that maybe, not that Saban necessarily, um, you know, is losing some of his touch, but nobody would have left Alabama five years ago. If you were there, you were there. Now, you could argue, again, of the 12 scholarship players, they could all be scholarship freshmen, guys who didn't want to sit and didn't want to wait. I didn't get the exact list of names, so I don't know. Um, I, I would generally think, though, that when it comes to Alabama, they haven't seen anything like this in a while. You know, they just – they haven't. Um, and, and from that standpoint, how is Saban going to adjust? We assume he's going to lock and reload. But we also know that they weren't the most talented roster this year, specifically not in the SEC, but certainly not across the country. And with that, 
they're going to have to figure out a way uh, to get back to where they were. And that might not be as easy as you think. But Georgia now also has the benefit with all these players in the transfer portal. Guess what? You get to choose who you want. Players don't, players in the transfer portal don't choose Georgia. Georgia chooses them. And that's the position that Kirby Smart has put this program in. On the on the brink of another national championship and uh being able to to, to lock and reload with whatever's gone. 38 quarterbacks in there. One of them coming to Georgia. Who knows? Maybe JT Daniels will circle on his way back. He entered the transfer portal out of out of West Virginia. Maybe it's his time. Maybe he didn't want a city or wanted to play, and now he wants to go back and play at Georgia. Wouldn't surprise me. Should it surprise you? I don't think so. But with Stetson Bennett officially done after his you know, 11th year of college, um, where Georgia goes next, do they have that kid on the roster? Do they want to make uh, Gunner, whatever his name is, and Brockton, and what you know, weirdest names from go to quarterback at Georgia. Anyway, uh, or do they want to bring somebody else in who can keep them at the level where they are? I would tend to think they don't want the growing pains of a young quarterback. Not when you're at a championship level. Hired gun all the way if you're if you're Kirby Smart. If the best available quarterback that's out there, bring him in and win. Why do you think what do you think Lincoln Wiley did when he went to USC? Took the best available quarterback out there, brought him there, and they won. That's why this stuff is important. So curious to see how the rest of the transfer portal shakes out. Again, I think it's great. I think it's great for players. I think it's great for the sport. If you don't think that, um, well, we're probably not going to laugh at the same jokes. That said, uh, if you'd like to enjoy something that I enjoy, you can go check out Locked On Falcons with Aaron Freeman. Make that your first listen every day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. It's available in the Odyssey app and wherever you get your podcasts uh before we get to the atlanta hawks and their issues let's hand out the shovel of wisdom brace yourselves because it's time for the shovel of wisdom yeah you know how we do it every day somebody says or does something stupid and we have to reward them we have to remind them of who they are and where they are and why they're dumb. Uh, and you can do so on my Twitter account at Mark Zinno, M-A-R-K-Z-I-N-N-O. Use the hashtag shovel of wisdom. And today my shovel goes to ESPN.com. I don't like it when they do this. Um, there is literally no reason to do this. You know, as I was getting ready for this show today, I was, I was, um, scooting around and looking around just, you know, for uh, what things were interesting and what piqued my interest. And I went over to the NFL pitch because there's a lot going on in the NFL. Baker Mayfield uh, is going to the Rams. Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't need surgery uh, and could return this year. The Titans fired their GM. Cowboys doesn't look like they're going to sign OBJ. All this stuff is interesting. All this stuff is interesting. And somewhere in along all those headlines, ESPN.com, the sports site, decided to leave a story on there Herschel Walker loses runoff election in Georgia. Now, I don't have a problem stating the facts, but ESPN doesn't need to have this on their website. Uh, and it's not even titled by an author. It's ESPN News Services. And at the bottom, information the Associated Press was used in this, uh, from the Associated Press was used in this report. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it goes on. To, it doesn't say anything uh, that isn't true. But again, it's a little bit of a scathing report uh, about what he was accused of by former girlfriends and abortions and, you know, holding a gun to his ex-wife's head and things that like, you know, all stuff that you've seen in these ads for the past month. I just, for me, you have ABC, put that story on there. It doesn't need to be on there. And anybody who uh, is anybody who's paying attention to life knows that Herschel Walker lost, at least in the state of Georgia. I get it. ESPN.com is a national site, but I just get irritated with stuff like that. There's no, it, it, I, can we can we do our best to at least draw some sort of line? I understand that politics and sports intersect, and I'm not saying they shouldn't. Can we do our best to just draw some sort of line that that's just completely not necessary on the NFL page of all things, for crying out loud? Like, really? You know, if you wanted to 
uh, post a, a – and ESPN has done this before on their homepage, you know, uh, where they – under the top headlines, they have a little redirect that says ABC News on it and and a, and a quick little blurb for you to click on that takes you to the ABC News site. ABC News site. I'm fine with that. Like that to me is a little bit different. Keep your politics out of the sports, bro, especially stuff like that. You don't need to do it. All right, good. Now that we've done that, let's move on. Atlanta Hawks uh, tonight will be back on the road. Uh, they will be in New York, and they will be facing the New York Knicks. Now, after the events of uh, – it was uh, Monday and, um, you know, Tuesday being questioned by uh, Zach Klein of WSB, and we've all seen the interaction on it. We've all seen it online. Um, yeah, uh, it, it wasn't good. Right. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, good that came out of that. And the Hawks went out and got beat up at home by the Oklahoma City Thunder, including giving up 37 points in the fourth quarter, 67 points in the second half uh, and took a, a game that they had a lead in and blew it. So there's that. And at one point in this game, I think the Hawks had a double digit lead, if I recall correctly. They did. Yeah, they, they had a, a 12 point lead. So uh, beyond that, that was in the third quarter and they blew it. Beyond that, uh, how does Trey Young respond? How do the Hawks respond to all of this? You know, th there's not a season that's going to go by that's not going to be dealt with. That's not going to, you know, be void of adversity. It's not going to be void of problems or headaches or things that get in the way or, you know, consternation, fights, disagreement. I mean, you know, you can't do anything for six months straight with the same exact people without – have, having somebody rub you the wrong way. It's just not possible, right? It's just not something that, that's going to go down that simple. So from all that, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's fair to, to say that we all understand that that sort of, sort of, sort of stuff is going to happen. But how do you deal with it? How do you overcome it? I, I mean, in my opinion, it's completely fair to say that Trey Young botched that whole thing uh, in the way he handled it. You know, the, the, the lack of accountability piece to me was a little bit, you know, unsettling, we'll call it that. Uh, I, I would have expected better of the leader of the team. And while Zach, you could argue Zach Klein didn't need to press as hard as he did and may have went a little bit overboard. Um, if you'd like to argue that, fine. I think Zach's just doing his job. Uh, the problem is, is that Trey never sat there and took accountability. And because you never took accountability, the questions persisted. Because as I said yesterday, if he just says, I'm sorry, uh, it's my fault, or that's on me. It's my responsibility, you know, without even saying I'm sorry. And guess what? This stuff goes away fairly quickly. But now we got this thing hanging out there. And now it's a question of not only how do you respond off the court, how do you respond on the court? Because sometimes it's okay to let your play do the talking, right? Sometimes it's okay to sit there and just go, you know what? Uh, I ain't got much more to say about this. Uh, I'll take all my business onto the court and go out there and handle your business on the court. That's okay. Um, but if you start to struggle now, the next assumption is if the Hawks lose to the lowly Oklahoma City Thunder, even though the Thunder are playing really well to start this year, um, or at least really well, comparatively speaking. But if they lose, you know, to the Oklahoma City Thunder and then lose to the Knicks in back to back games, now all of a sudden we start to have this creepy to our head like, ah, maybe it's in his head. Maybe he's maybe he's still flustered by it. Maybe, maybe the coach and him aren't getting along. Like that's how this stuff continues, right? And 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 have a bad shooting night, you know, and have the coach have to pull you and watch how that interaction goes over online. Again, sort of self-inflicted wound by Trey, but this is where it is. Again, uh, I think Trey just has finally, for me proven himself as not the number one guy. He could be a number one on the stat sheet, but he's not a number one guy that you're going to build a championship around. I think that's fair to say. Again, KD could fill up a stat sheet. He was never the number one guy you're building a championship around. KD can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Giannis just the same way uh, Trey Young did in the Eastern Conference Finals, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Giannis. And guess what? Still not winning a championship around that guy. It's happened before on both ends. So this is where I think the Hawks are. Let's see how they respond. Uh, I got a lot of confidence in, confidence in Trey to play well. I think we all do. But part of this whole thing for Trey now 
is getting other guys to play well with him. Proving that you can be sort of a uh, harbinger of peace, bring players together, bring the coaches together, and start winning more ball games because ultimately that is what you're going to be judged against one way or another. And if you end up as a six or seven seed in the East again, it's like, eh, we got better, but did we really? So long season, a lot left to do, but uh, it'll be very, very apparent to me uh, how the Hawks respond tonight and, and what they show out on the court and what Trey shows out on the court as far as where things are and where they could go. Remember, this was the easy stretch, folks. This was the easy stretch of games that the, the Hawks could get fat and happy. They've lost four of their last six. Uh, with one of those wins coming without Trey on the court. Make of that what you will. But they got two games in New York against the Knicks and Brooklyn uh, before they come back home for a game on Sunday against Chicago. Let's see where they're at. I want to remind you guys to make Locked On Falcons your first listen for your next listen. Check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast, That'll do it for us here on this Wednesday. Back tomorrow for a Thursday show. You guys have a wonderful day. Don't take any crap from anybody. See you.